Association. Vermont Fuel Dealers, Fuel Dealers Association, or VFDA, is a trade association representing heating oil and propane sellers, as well as heating service companies. Um, we provide training for over a thousand heating technicians a year and offer a variety of regulatory assistance for both consumers and for our member companies. Um, with me today is Peter Bourne of Bourne's Energy in Morrisville, uh, Judy Taranovich of Proctor Gas in Proctor, Vermont, Casey Coda of Coda & Coda Oil in Bells Falls, Vermont, and Manny Fletcher of Vile Brothers in Orwell, Vermont. Um, I, if it's okay with the chair, uh, uh, I'd like to provide a little bit of background about our industry um, uh, and talk about a few specific bills then allow uh, VFDA's board president, Manny Fletcher, to offer some uh, testimony, and uh, as well as uh, Peter, Judy, and Casey, uh, sort of our reflections on what we do here in Vermont and the value that we think we bring to the state. Um, behind me, you'll see some of the people that work for uh, fuel companies in Vermont. Um, there are thousands of employees that uh, deliver oil and propane and provide heating service in Vermont. Um, and these are the types of jobs they do. It's hard work, it's skilled work, it's well-paid work. Um, one of the things that we also do at Vermont Fuel Dealers Association is we help interpret the regulations for consumers and for the fuel dealers. In uh, 2011, um, the state of Vermont uh, ordered the Department of, excuse me, the legislature asked the state of Vermont uh, through the Department of Environmental Conservation to pass tank regulations. So we made sure that all 120,000 heating oil tanks out there we're safe to fill. And that was an important regulation. It's a regulation that we worked on uh, with the department, with the legislature. And in 2017, we mandated, the state of Vermont mandated inspections. And that had the effect of reducing the amount of spills. Uh, it also allowed me to go out and, grab, and, and apply for and get a federal grant um, through the National Oil Heat Research Alliance to incentivize people to take out non-compliant oil tanks and put in new oil tanks. So if you were today go out and replace your old oil tank with a new oil tank, uh, you could qualify for a $250 rebate through that association that VFDA has with the National Heat Research Alliance. And more about that information is on there. You may have heard me say this before, but the reason why I bring it up is because when we talk about bills in this committee, uh, you know, one of them, H462, the uh, Act Related to Climate Change, with regards to a citizen being able to take a private right of action against an entity if they feel aggrieved by climate change. You know, I, frankly, I worry about my little trade association. We are incentivizing people to use fossil fuels. Um, you know, fuel dealers that sell fossil fuels. You know, the, the, the testimony from Luke Martland shook me to my core. Uh, the idea that if we continue to sell fossil fuels past the goals that become statute, that we are, in fact, liable. Um, so that's. I'm happy to talk more about 462, but to get through other testimony, you know, in 2011, the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association brought an issue before the legislature, uh, and we worked extensively with Renewable Energy Vermont and other environmental groups to pass the Clean and Efficient Oil Lead Initiative, uh, which is to change the, the content of our fuel radically, to reduce the sulfur content from as much as 2,000 parts per million to right to where it is now to 15 parts per million. The oil heat that we sell in Vermont is clean. You heard testimony last week from Mr. Epsilon, who is a brilliant businessman, but he talked about dirty oil and black smokestacks. Those do not exist. We do not sell that fuel. We sell only ultra-low sulfur heating oil. Why? Because the legislature mandated it. They passed a law in 2011, and as of July 1, 2018, every drop of oil has to be ultra-low sulfur, eliminating uh, nearly all nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxides. That's that scale that used to be cleaned out of all that, of the, all those heat exchangers that I showed you a couple of months back. Um, that is gone. There's no black smokestacks anymore, contrary to what Mr. Abslin testified. Uh, now, what he did testify, and what might have been lost, is the fact that you also effectively uh, uh, set a, a deadline for eliminating the worst of the worst fuel, which is number six fuel, sometimes called bunker oil, sometimes called residual fuel or heavy oil. This is the stuff that goes into ships. This is the stuff that goes into large manufacturing facilities. Um, this stuff is dirty stuff, right? Very high sulfur dioxide. And Mr. Evelyn's company is successfully replacing this, not in all cases. It's being replaced in some areas, particularly uh, in one very large uh, facility in Chittenden County uh, with two oil rather than, than natural gas. But in, in, in most cases, uh, this, this oil is a thing of the past. We've reduced it by 85, 90 percent 
uh, over the past 20 years, it will be eliminated. It will be eliminated uh, in very short order. The stats from the Energy Information Administration only go up to 2016, but in 2016 we were less than 2 million gallons from a high of 14 million gallons. We will be at zero. Uh, if we're not already there, we will be, and I expect the stats to reflect that. Residual oil has to be heated to 212 degrees Fahrenheit just to keep it liquid enough to burn. This is the bad stuff, right? So at a large manufacturing plant, they are now using CNG, truck gas, right, cleaner. They're using clean burning ultra low sulfur heating oil, or they're using propane. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for the environment, and something that, frankly, you're never gonna see a press release from it. But we have eliminated, we have eliminated 14 million gallons, uh, just because of action taken by the legislature, to eliminate that bad fuel. Just as an aside, can I ask you, yep. so uh, what about Amtrak? Or, or the, or the yep. freight trains. So, so the locomotives use use. Uh, give it up. Let's hold it they use this, dye diesel, ultra low sulfur, clean burning, uh, dye diesel. I've, I've noticed when I've whenever I've gone, I've gone to White River Junction that there's a, a locomotive sitting there running all the time, and okay. they say it's running to keep the the uh, the fuel warm. Anything about that? Okay. I don't speak for the trade. Aside, but, but, yeah, but <laughs> okay. Interesting. I, yeah. I, I don't know the answer yeah. to that question. Okay. Um, okay. But in all cases, CNG is not replacing um, uh, uh, that that awful heavy oil, right? In many cases, it's it's oil heat. And why is that? Well, the fact of the matter is, we have something called firm and interruptible natural gas, right? So we know this. We've gone. We've seen this slide before. Uh, you have, as uh, Mr. Murray with Vermont Gas will tell you, uh, we have firm customers and we have interruptible customers. Firm customers are the small businesses and homes, and the interruptible customers are the large users of nat pipe natural gas, which include manufacturing plants, include power plants, large buildings and institutions, right? So they are interruptible customers, they get a better rate, but they also have to have a backup source of fuel. That is not trucked CNG. Trucked CNG is an interruptible customer, so when a large manufacturing plant in Essex, uh, if they are put on interruptible, what are they relying on? Well, they used to rely on six oil. Now they rely on clean burning ultra low sulfur heating oil, not CNG for their backup source. So that's a long way of saying liquid fuels plays an important role in our energy infrastructure, particularly when it comes to electricity. Go ahead. So question. Why? Why? Because you're relying on um, CNG. So C and G, uh, and, this, and, I, and, I'm, and Mr. Murray will correct me if I'm wrong here, but C and G at the facility at NG Advantage is, is just like the Global Foundries plant, just like the hospital, an interruptible pipe natural gas customer. So when it gets really cold, it doesn't happen every year, but it can happen like during the bomb, cy bomb cyclone, um, those customers of pipe natural gas have to rely on a backup supply. But if but but since NG Advantage is an interruptible customer, their their trucks aren't they're they're not available for that. They need storage of two oil or propane in order to flip on the switch when pipe gas is interrupted. Compressed natural gas, sorry. It's not trucked in. Compressed natural gas is trucked in. But even though it's trucked in, it is an interruptible customer through Vermont gas systems. Scott, yeah. Yeah. Well, just to follow up on Laura's comment, but if they had a truck sitting there full of, full of compressed natural gas, then they could use that, right? So with the energy advantage is, 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 is interruptible, but, but the trucks that are out there are that's, out there. That's true, but, but you'll find mm -hmm. that whether you're Global Foundries or the UVM Medical Center, you use more than a truck. You use more than a truck and you need tanks. We have the best energy, we talk about energy storage everywhere we go, right? We have the best energy storage systems and it's been around for 120 years, they're called tanks. They store a tremendous amount of energy in a small amount of tanks. <laughs> and it's safer to store. Uh, so, so, so to, to conclude with the infrastructure, um, this is an important point. The power plants, so we're, which are peaking. We use the most amount of electricity in January, typically. So when that happens, we rely on energy throughout the grid to provide enough electricity to supply us when it's very cold out, right? 
So we rely more and more on natural gas for our power production uh, during peak times in the winter. But there's a time when natural gas is interrupted and those power plants aren't getting their interruptible customers. And they rely on those power plants, rely dual cycle power plants that, rely, that, that use both natural gas, but when natural gas is interrupted, use clean burning, ultra low sulfur, diesel fuel, or heating oil. And that is such to a point that during the bomb cyclone, when there were 15 days of below zero temperatures, New England power producers needed 84 million gallons of clean burning ultra low sulfur heating oil to replace the natural gas that they weren't getting to create enough power to keep the lights on throughout New England for just 15 days they used 84 million gallons. By comparison, residential heating oil customers in Vermont use about 70 million gallons. They needed a year's supply of Vermont's heating oil in just 15 days to keep the lights on. We are a critical part of our energy infrastructure, not just for heating homes, but for powering businesses and keeping the lights on. Excuse me. I'm, I'm trying to understand the interruptible, non-interruptible. Sure. Let me go ahead. So I, I believe I get the, the natural gas part of that. Um, but you're saying even trucked CNG is is interruptible. Is fossil is is number two oil interruptible? The, we There's are no hierarchy of customers there. We are the, the, the backbone of both the electrical infrastructure and the heating infrastructure uh, because our product, you know, one gallon, 138,000 BTUs, um, is so uh, transportable, uh, it's safe, um, and the fact of the matter is, is that without it, um, the large power producers, not just in New England, but throughout the nation, um, would, be, would be in trouble without the availability of natural gas, which now provides the majority of our electricity, not in Vermont, throughout ISO New England. So the interruptibility is, is strictly a function of supply. Not enough pressure to go through the pipe, right? I'm not well, sure if I can, there's only so much in the pipeline. So when the cold, cold weather creates a draw on it where they don't have enough to take care of customers, it goes on, that they have to use the standby. Right. Compressed natural gas, they back their trucks up to a pipeline. They compress that gas off the pipeline into their trucks. That is why okay. they are. They don't have a storage facility where they load their gas like we do. Theirs comes off the pipeline. So when the pipeline goes on standby, they're not able to back up, compress that, it, and put that it was in. The piece I was okay, I just, that was what I thought. And yeah. this is not a Vermont gas, thank you for that, Manny. And this is not a Vermont gas issue. This is throughout the country. This is how pipelines work. Um, back to electric coal climate heat pumps, because, yeah, I had a question. sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I don't take issue with the, uh, uh, with anything you've said about uh, being an essential part of our uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, you play a valuable part in that. What I do take issue with is your characterization of fuel oil as clean, because even though you have ultra low sulfur, and it, it does reduce uh, sulfur dioxide emissions and uh, NOx emissions and things like that, it still produces carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, which is contributing to climate change. What do you propose to do to offset the amount of carbon dioxide that's being produced in terms of heating fuel, um, you know, diesel fuel, um, and transportation, that sort of thing? When <clears throat> Vermont gas uh, and electric utilities, uh, we have pro they're regulated. We have programs in there that um, that require them to um, help customers be more efficient, uh, reduce their energy consumption, things like that. What is what is the fossil fuel industry, the non-regulated fuels, doing to do the same thing? That's a great point, Representative Anatasha. Um, and one of the things that we have done, one of the things that was part of the Clean and Green Oil Heat Initiative in 2011, was to increase the levels of biodiesel content, renewable distillate, into the supply of diesel fuel and to heating oil. One of the presenters after me uh, is one of the largest sellers of biodiesel in the state of Vermont and can answer some of those questions about the renewable content of the fuel and, and how we are as an industry. Our, our goal is to be 100% renewable, to be able to sell by 2050 100% renewable <coughs> distillate product for both on-road vehicles and for heating. 
that's the that's the industry's goal through the National Heat Research Alliance. And what about customers? We we passed in the House uh, a couple of weeks ago the uh, uh, weatherization bill, which adds two cents per gallon to uh, home heating home heating fuels and dyed diesel in order to provide more low-income weatherization funds. Uh, that to me is an important program that would help homeowners and uh, well, basically homeowners, low-income homeowners, reduce their fuel consumption and thereby reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's a lot of objection to that um, and it didn't pass with a, uh, you know, it passed with a solid majority but not there were a lot of objections to it. In the meantime, since that happened, fuel oil prices have increased by five cents, which is twice as much as the increase, two and a half times as much as the increase that we were proposing to help low-income homeowners. Now, to say that's market pressures that caused the increase in prices, but we don't have control over market uh, pressures like that. We do have control over the kind of revenue we can produce with a minuscule tax to help people reduce their heating bills. Besides my, uh, <laughs> What's your question? my question, <laughs> my question is, can you get behind programs like that to say this is a good thing? So. In testimony before the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, uh, we have supported the reauthorization of the existing fuel tax. It's a tax that we have paid for for nearly 30 years now, supporting the low-income weatherization, and I know you have been a champion of the weatherization programs. Um, we, we understand that the, the advantages for a homeowner for health and safety, um, particularly when it comes to um, um, issues related to carbon monoxide, uh, to, to mold issues related to damp homes. We know the weatherization people. We've seen their work, and, and, and you know, they help install fossil fuel burning uh, heating systems in the middle of the night in the winter through their emergency system program. We understand that. We just don't think that the tax should be increased. That said, you asked about other programs. People don't call Peter and Casey's and Judy's and Manny's office and ask to burn more fuel. Uh, they want to burn less. Everyone's selling fuel, not everyone nearly all fuel sellers uh, provide service. They have to. Mm -hmm. They have to have someone on call in the middle of the night, pay them time and a half to get out there and fix something if, it's, if there's no heat. Um, they also provide service and upgrade equipment, provide more efficient equipment. Many fuel dealers, not all, but many fuel dealers also do weatherization services for non-low income, for people that aren't qualified. Um, they understand that's part of their business model. And without a taxpayer funded program, without a ratepayer funded program, We've seen our gallons drop dramatically. In the 1970s, the average home uses 1,700 gallons of heating oil. Now we're 680. We'll be 500 soon. A lot because of cold climate heat pumps. A lot because of wood stoves. A lot because of better weatherization, better equipment, better fuel. We understand the future is not in selling more fuel to fewer people. It's selling less fuel to more people. And that's why we got behind the biodiesel effort. That's why we got behind the ultra low sulfur uh, effort is because we realize that we can't sell more fuel to our customers. That said, you install a new piece of uh, equipment today, a new burner, a new Beckett burner, a new rail burner, a new boiler, a new furnace, even one that's just middle of the road, you are light years ahead of where you are if you're taking out a 30 or 40 year old piece of equipment. It's not different than buying a, you know, a, a new a Hyundai today is gonna be drive a whole lot better than a Porsche bought in 1970. Um, so we see our gallons going down. We see our receipts going down. Um, do we need to uh, create a ratepayer funded program to increase that? We don't think so. And I understand that there's a disagreement. So we're not going to debate this now. Okay. Do you have a question? All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll just follow up with a comment about, about how um, electric utilities, regular utilities under tier three are required to do something about reducing fossil fuel users and the unregulated utilities that deliver fuels don't have that same requirement. So that's that, that's why a, that's why a, a two cent increase is not a terrible idea. Right? Okay. 
<laughs> it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so, so, so to get back to some of the big, big ideas that we that we that I've certainly been around for the last uh, 13 years, I've been doing this, which is you know the move to back to the future, right? In the 1950s, 1960s, we talked about electrifying the homes, the gold medallion homes that Ronald Reagan, you know, got, took uh, sponsored from GE and all that stuff, and how we're going to have. Uh, uh, electricity that's too cheap to meter thanks to the nuclear power plants. Of course, that didn't come to pass. And, and you know, at one point, you know, oil heat represented 90% of the heat in homes. Uh, that has changed. That has changed, obviously. But we're, we're seeing a return to electric heat through cold climate heat pumps. Um, in cold climate heat pumps, they work. They provide air conditioning in the summer, efficient air conditioning in the summer, which more and more people want. We, you know, more than 60% of our homes in Vermont are hydronically heated. They're boilers working through baseboard radiation, um, and they don't have ducting. They can't install a, 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 a central air conditioner. So they have the window rattler, or they have a cold climate heat pump, which can produce an efficient source of air conditioning in the summer. It also is a space heater, so it can take the chill off and provide heat in the fall and the spring. But when it is zero degrees out or below zero out, um, those condensers are outside. Remember, we're taking the ambient air and we're either turning it into cold air or turning it into hot air. So in the winter time, when those condensers freeze, the only way to unfreeze them, other than get out there with a blowtorch, is to turn on the air conditioning. So in order to unfreeze the condensers when it's very cold, you are turning on the air conditioning in an already cold house. So this is why it doesn't work all the time. So in other words, electric heat, unless you're home, uh, now new home construction, at zero construction, absolutely. But in most homes in Vermont, you are still going to need another source of heat, and that's going to generally be fire. It's going to be wood, wood pellets, it's going to be gas, it's going to be oil. Uh, and and the, the issue is, is not only are we using air conditioning to unfreeze electric heat pumps in the middle of the winter, that electricity is coming from, remember peak demand and the interruptible power, it's coming from oil. So we're using oil-fired air conditioners to unfreeze electric heat pumps in the middle of winter. That's a long way of getting to the fact that H51, which is in H51, which I think the intent of it is to stop the natural gas pipeline from expanding. And that may be true. Um, I don't know the intent. But it has very specific exemptions for tanks that are hooked to homes for heat. That's appropriate. It has a very specific exemption for tanks that are hooked to pumps for people to fill up their cars. So we've exempted the service station that has the pumps that fill up your gas or diesel fuel. We've exempted the tanks that are hooked to homes. But what is not explicitly exempt and what a attorney might view as fossil fuel infrastructure are the bulk storage facilities, which we, before it gets to your tank, before it gets to your car, or the tank that feeds the car, is all of the very large 20,000, 30,000 gallons and up tanks that we need to get the fuel from Albany or from Montreal or from Portsmouth or from Springfield, Mass, and put it there so it's near your home in time for us to deliver it in order for your home to stay warm. So if you were to proceed with H51, um, I, would, I would ask that the bulk storage facilities that store propane, gasoline, heating oil, kerosene, uh, and did I say propane already? Propane, heating oil, diesel fuel, gasoline, be exempt um, explicitly as is tanks that are connected to a home or a building. Excuse me. <clears throat> I have a question just for clarification. So uh, you're probably aware um, where I live, yes. 100, uh, we have uh, NIDOS fuel oil there. Yeah. And they have a very large tank um, at their place which I presume they used to fill their trucks with yes. for delivery. That's right. Is that what you are referencing? That is what I'm referencing. So Wait, the- we, That is not exempted as part of this? Yes, so okay. what, what, it, what it specifically calls out is new construction. So in essence, this is where it gets challenging as I represent uh, all fuel dealers, but if you have a bulk plant and you're pretty satisfied with your storage for the next 30 years, or if you're in the gas pipelines path in Rutland, this bill, as Mr. Evelyn suggested, would actually eliminate your competition. Um, however, uh, as we want more choices and more choices bring lower prices, um, the and, and tanks don't last forever, the ability to replace them, um, uh, in the interest of continuing to sell um, gasoline, heating oil, diesel fuel, and propane, uh, we would ask that that be removed if shall this bill go forward. 
But but then back to the other point, well, but perhaps the intent of the bill is not necessarily to make it easier for us to sell heating oil, propane, gasoline, and diesel fuel. And and that really gets at the core of, of some of the stuff that I hear in the building, which is that we're a drain on the economy, and this is a good thing. And, and, and what I'd like to, before I segue to my, my boss, my Manny Fletcher, is to say that, yes, uh, we don't produce any oil or gas here. Uh, it comes from far off places as Pennsylvania and Texas and Quebec. Um, uh, but this computer came from China. Uh, I'm sure it was bought at a local store. Um, lots of the stuff, except for cheese and milk, maple syrup. We import a lot of goods here. And beer. Sorry, and beer. Um, and, 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 it, and, it is, and it is frustrating. It's frustrating to think that, that there is a belief that we're a drain on the economy when we sincerely believe we fuel the economy. And, and if it's okay, I'll be around for questions, of course, but if it's okay, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mandy Fletcher to talk a little bit about, about the contributions. Can I ask just one more question, sure. Mr. Chair? So just going back to the storage tanks. Yes. So if we don't exempt the storage tanks, I would like to understand um, what that would mean, because we obviously would not have a, you know, even in an ideal world where we're not using any fossil fuels at all tomorrow, that's not going to happen. Right? So there's going to be some transition. Right. So we do not exempt fossil, those those big tanks, the nano tank. What would, how, what would the companies do? Well, like, to, in order to serve the customers? Like well, it, would, would it be, is my understanding, and again, it's a long way off, but if this bill, as written first draft, becomes law tomorrow, it would mean anyone with an existing infrastructure for as long as that infrastructure was around, it would be fine. It would mean anyone that wanted to expand oh, their operation. New tank, yeah. If 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 Hannah and, and Greg Nido wanted to expand into Bennington, they don't want to go over Route Nine. Yeah. So they want to put a tank over on the other side of North Bennington. Then then they would essentially be. You have to get a federal permit. You have to get a state permit. And if I were running the uh, Department of Environmental Conservation and this law was passed, I'd say to Greg and Hannah, Yes, no, you can't do this. Yeah. Their existing tank is, is right. grandfathered. That's that's my assumption. Uh, again, we're dealing with the first draft of a bill. Okay. Um, right. But that's my assumption. Thank you. If it's okay with the chair, yeah. please, Manny. Good morning. Good morning. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, my name is Manny Fletcher. I'm currently employed as uh, operations and compliance manager at Files Brothers Incorporated in Orwell, Vermont. Um, I've been in the propane industry for about 35 years. Uh, we're a, a small family, owned, well not small, but we're a family owned propane company uh, that serves Rutland and Addison counties in Vermont. Uh, we do a lot of residential, commercial, and agricultural. We have a lot of farms that we service. Um, I've been on the board of directors for VFDA for 16 years, and I'm the current president. Uh, I was born and raised in Vermont, as was my father my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my great-great-grandfather. Um, I come from a long line of Vermont farmers. Uh, we ended up relocating to Montpelier after the uh, farm and house were burnt in 49. Um, I grew up, like I said, in Montpelier. My family was blue collar. Uh, we were proud to, to do a hard day's work and get paid an honest wage for it. Uh, my dad worked two jobs most of my life. He worked construction, he worked uh, as a machine operator at a place called Capital City Press, which was a local printing company, which is no longer here. My mother worked in a plastics plant called Ready Plastics here in Montpelier, which is also no longer here. Um, I graduated a stone's throw from here, from Montpelier High School, in uh, 1980. College was not in my future. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I didn't feel like I should use my father's hard-earned money to to pay for something that I didn't want to know what I wanted to do. Um, at 18, I became a part of the Vermont workforce. I worked construction, I worked uh, retail, I worked at a ski area, I cooked in a restaurant. It was a hard time to find a job in 1980. And I bounced around, stayed employed, but uh, couldn't find that one thing that I wanted to do in the career that I was looking for. Um, in 84, I was offered a job as a propane delivery driver. It was a hard, hard job, hard work. I was making $4.75 an hour, plus benefits. Uh, I listened, I worked hard, 
uh, did what I was told, and I used the work ethic that my parents put in me to uh, advance. Uh, I eventually became a manager. Uh, I've been a manager for about 18 years now. Because of the propane industry, I'm a homeowner, I'm a consumer, I'm a taxpayer, and I put two children through college. That's something I'm proud of. Uh, the industry's been good to me. And that's why it's so frustrating to hear repeated over and over that the, the products and services that we sell are not contributing to the local economy. Uh, there are currently over 1,200 CDL operators with hazmat endorsements in Vermont. There's 2,567 Vermont certified gas technicians, 794 certified oil technicians, and there's over a thousand customer service representatives in Vermont. These are all working Vermonters, making a decent living, buying local, paying taxes, donating and volunteering to local charities, they're coaching their children's sports teams, and they're putting their kids through college. I understand that there are a lot of people in the state house that want to eliminate the use of petroleum, uh, eliminate the use of petroleum products, including the fuels that we sell. But for our customers that depend on us. The service that we provide is not a luxury, it's a necessity of life. Uh, Vermont represents a tiny fraction of the global fossil fuel consumption. We have the lowest greenhouse gas emissions of any state in the country, according to the EPA. Will eliminating a small amount of fossil fuels consumed in Vermont change be worth the cost, the cost of Vermont? Uh, make no mistakes, it'll cost over 5,000 jobs in our industry alone. The cost of everything will go up. Trucking to bring products in and out of the state will go up. That will cause businesses to leave the state and take jobs with them. Uh, Vermont would become too expensive for the average Vermonter and people would need to leave the state. As I said earlier, my father, his father, his father, and his father were all born here. They're all buried here too. Uh, it troubles me to think that I may have to leave this state to find work in my field um, because of a, a plan that will make the already cleanest state in the country a little cleaner, which would amount to very little on a global scale. Again, I, I thank you for your time. Um, and one more misconception that I, I think I hear is that a lot of people think the money that's spent on fossil fuels goes to big companies and the, the, you know, the, the large, large companies. But there's a lot of it that goes right here in Vermont and stays right here in Vermont. And we feel that we are important to the industry, to the, to the state. Again, I thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm really sorry, I didn't catch your first name. Manny? Manny. It's manual, but I go by Manny. Thank you for your testimony, Manny. I have a question for okay. you. So we have done a lot of work around efficiency and alternative um, fuels uh, over the years and continuing to do that. And I, I support that work. Um, and I also support our small businesses. I would have to imagine that that work is impacting your members. It is. And so my question for you is, are your members doing um, anything to diversify their revenue streams, their business models that you can tell us about? There are a lot of members that are getting into selling other products. Like I said, Peter sells the biodiesel. Peter, uh, there's, there's fuel dealers that have gone to selling pellets. They've gone to doing a lot of things. I mean, we're trying to stick to one product, which we do best. Um, I can't speak for all dealers, but there, there are a lot of things going on out there, a lot of guys that are, that are venturing out into other products. We are just trying to provide a good service at a good price and gain our customer or our share of the marketplace uh, by doing that. I do, I mean, the efficiency, there, there's one thing that, that has been kind of sticking with me for years. The, the low income Vermonters and the weatherization fund to homeowners of low income is a great thing. What we're missing is uh, rentals, uh, people who rent an apartment, the landlords. There's no reason for a landlord to put money into an apartment, it's going to raise his taxes. So therefore he's not, it's an investment of his, he's not going to dump a lot of money into making a house tighter or put in the best heater so that his tenant pays less because they're paying the bill. 
that's where we're missing a huge, I mean, the weatherization, you can give it to the low income homeowner, there's not, there's, there's a lot of them, but in the grand scale of things, it's the tenant that, that we're missing out on as far as doing that. I have no idea how <laughs> you take that two cents that we're paying and you work some kind of program to give some kind of incentive for a landlord to, to do better. But that's the big part that you're missing. So I think I, Eric, I, 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 I would like to follow up on my question with you, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of less fuel being used, your small business is being impacted. I represent rural Vermont. You know, some of these bigger, more urban solutions that we know could could be in the future for um, heating, like district heating, you know, all of these that may be available for more densely populated areas. There's, I know that those will be very long time coming to rural Vermont. So I, when my question around diversification is, are there any businesses in your association or in your fields that are looking kind of at the big, the big picture of heating needs um, around, um, including the efficiency? So, so are like a complete kind of heating company? Um, are any of your members doing that? So, in addition to maybe say, you know, offering delivering heating fuels. Um, also offering and installing um, heating pumps or, or pellet stoves. Like, do you have any companies that are kind of transforming into heating companies as opposed to? Um, I think a lot of our, our offering heat pumps as a solution. And of course, it's not our top priority as far as, I mean, it, 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 you know, we get the sell, which yeah. the, the cost of a heat pump with the rebates and whatnot doesn't make a lot of money. So it's, yeah. not, it's not like we're going to get, you know, be able to sustain by just selling heat pumps. Um, but we do offer them. If the customer's interested in one and we want to help them supplement their heat or in a certain area or add air conditioning, we, we do offer and we do sell them. I mean, I think we can find other places when we come up here. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. and, and the other the other question that I'm and then I'm done. That, yeah. uh, and I thank you for this. Um, is <clears throat> just if there are any um, support that would be needed for some of your smaller companies to be able to transition into a, a larger service um, providing model, like I'm talking about, like more of a heating model as opposed to just fuel. And I know Heidi's saying we're going to have additional testing. Yeah, I, 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 exactly. I think okay. Peter can, can okay. answer this question. Yeah. Right. Can I? So um, I'm also curious about the, um, the industry generally with regard to distributors. Do we have more distributors than we had 10 years ago? Is there a consolidation in there's uh, more of a consolidation. Of, yeah. um, and I, some of this has gone on in my area, in the Upper Valley. There, one, there's some consolidation going on. Two, there's some new owners who have gotten in. And I guess the, the, the other question I have, just related, um, is uh, to the extent that a propane dealer in um, Montpelier uh, is serving a geography that is served by multiple dealers, um, how much competition is there um, a lot of competition? Well, I, I, just, I don't know much about um, you know how uh, you know how this occurs kind of around the state in different geographic footprints. Yeah, um, as far as my company, we we try to stay primarily in Addison County. Mm -hmm. We go, go part of Rutland County. That's my owner. That that's yeah. what he wants. He doesn't want to expand too far. Yeah, he wants to take care of his area. There's other companies that, that are owned by national companies, or there's other independent owned companies that have branched out because of a need. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have one person in one area, uh, you're the only game in town. If you can get someone else to come in the area, of course, then competition helps as far as, as uh, you know, for the customer. The best thing for the customer is competition. But is there consolidation going on? Are there mom and pop distributors that have, are starting to go? There are some that sell. There, there's always... In the Upper Valley, uh, 20 years ago, we would never see Irving trucks. Now we see right. a lot of Irving right. trucks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm just curious. To they're always in acquisition them. mode, and they're always wanting to buy. Um, So that, that's always happening. Yeah, if, if I may, um, absolutely. Fewer companies today uh, than 30 years ago. Fewer companies today than when I started at the FDA 13 years ago. Just consolidation in the market. It just happened. We're selling fewer gallons to fewer customers. It's natural. Yeah. Um, however, whenever there is consolidation, um, we often see the local companies benefit somewhat because people 
see a different different truck, different driver, different people in the front office, and they and they all of a sudden decide they want to choose differently. You also see an opportunity an opportunity for small operators to get into the market, an opportunity to expand territory, and an opportunity to get in the market. That goes away if we can't build bulk tanks. If you can't build bulk tanks. Uh, you're not going to drive a, a fuel oil truck um, from, from Morrisville to Bennington. Um, but if you had a bulk tank there, you could establish a new operation and, and, and do something. So that's why the bulk storage um, uh, is so acute to us in, in H51 that perhaps may be overlooked, perhaps was on purpose. I don't know. I can tell you that the reading, the reading H51 is written, uh, I do not feel comfortable advising my members that they go forward and get, if this became law, that they would successfully <coughs> be able to obtain a permit. Uh, to build bulk storage. Yeah. Again, I, and I don't want to take us on a tangent. I, I, I'm, and we can have this conversation offline. I'm really interested in how the, the um, industry and your trade association has maybe changed in the last 20 years. A few, um, few member dues. Well, <laughs> yeah. <that's right. laughs> You're still dressed just as well. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you know, and this happens with a lot of industries where there's consolidation and um, and this is not making a judgment, but there are more regional companies involved than maybe there were in the 1970s. That's true. You know what that looks like. Um, so anyway, go ahead, Mike. And then we'll just kind of yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I agree with you in terms of that, that issue with the renters. Uh, we do need to figure out a way to incentivize uh, landlords to uh, upgrade their. Uh, their efficiency, their weatherization, and I think I think we could do that. I think it's possible. Uh, we just have to uh, design a program that'll that'll accomplish that. I got to turn my phone off here. So, the other thing is, uh, as I said with Matt, I understand that you guys provide a valuable service uh, in terms of uh, helping people uh, continue to heat their homes and stuff, and. Uh, that is not going to go away overnight. Um, your point about all the jobs that would be lost and everything, that I would point out that that doesn't necessarily have to happen because we, we need to transition from our dependence on fossil fuels to uh, cleaner energy. And, and that can be done biodiesel, uh, uh, clean electric uh, usage, uh, things like that. So um, I understand the concern about loss of jobs and uh, the impact to the economy, but uh, I think that, that that is an adjustment that needs to be made. And uh, we need to transition to the point where we're less than uh, fossil fuels by 2050. Do you have questions, Matt? Uh, just two comments. Um, one is about the harvest place. <coughs> There are some programs for apartment buildings, and I, I'd like you to look up 3 dthermoorg when you get home. Um, but that's, that's, uh, she was key in establishing. Put that cabinet there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, which is available for owners who are doing projects on their building. And, um, and mostly, it's it's not places where tenants pay for the heat, it's places where it's, it's a large building with central heating. But anyway, um, and weatherization provides services for rentals as well. Um, the uh, second point was to, uh, just to follow up on, on Laura's uh, point, which was really on point, I thought, uh, about uh, uh, heating companies or fuel delivery companies transitioning to heating companies. Actually, uh, so I have a long history in, in weatherization coming at improving the efficiency of buildings from the point of view of s fixing the shell, fixing the building itself. But um, many of us always thought that it really the, the uh, the mechanical uh, systems uh, installers and and and, uh, and people who do the maintenance are, are that's really the, the, the place to start from to do to do efficiency improvements on buildings. So it'd be much easier for a mechanical company to expand into a, a, into weatherization work than for a weatherization company to expand into mechanical work. So I just plant that seed for for your for for the thought down the road. Okay. Hey. Uh, I would. Uh, as a landlord, I will say thank you. <laughs> um, and as much as people may know, I am a landlord, and, and I can tell you that um, that we, as long as our taxes and costs continue to increase at the um, exorbitant rate that they do, those kind of investments are not happening at places where 
uh, re residents are paying for their own heats. Um, and um, so that is just, and if we want to talk about landlords, I suggest we get the other landlords in here to, to talk about the situation with regard to uh, housing and housing opportunities. Um, this question might be over both, both our pay grades. <laughs> um, but the, you know, we often talk about propane, natural gas as a bridge fuel between uh, the, the dirty oil and the green future. And, uh, you know, and the state energy goals are um, for increasing the renewable by 20, 50, 25 years away. But investments in the infrastructure have a lifetime of 50 years anyway, you know, tanks, pipelines, and things like that. Um, and <clears throat> so I, I guess my, my question is about um, how do we make that transition when our bridge is, is that long? You know, because it doesn't make sense for you to invest in the propane, propane storage facility and rather than depreciate it, and I'm over my head here, depreciate it for 50 years, to be told you can only use it for 20. Right. Um, Matt, do you have? Well, we're hoping to use it for more than 20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we would politely with, disagree with, on, yeah. that, yeah. on that. Yeah. With biofuels. <laughs> Yeah. This is a, a, a segue to talk about biodiesel. Um, perhaps, um, perhaps a, a Peter Bourne sure. up here. Yeah. I don't know if you want. Thank to you. Thank 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 you. You probably don't need any of that. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Thank you for letting us speak this morning. So I'm Peter Bourne, President of Bourne Energy. We're a family-owned business based out of Morrisville. Uh, the company's been in business for 71 years. I went to work for my parents uh, out of high school, and I've been there for 46 years. On the second generation, we have a third generation. My son and one, and my, one of my nieces is working for us. And so we continue to uh, push forward to the future. We're about 95 employees, and these are full and part-time, mostly full, full benefits. So when we talk about other employment things, these are employees that are getting retirement plans, health care, the full benefit package. Everybody's covered here. It's not a, it's not considered a low, um, low-end job, or it's a considered more of a career. Um, we have a lot of young people working for us, coming out of the tech centers. We have. I think three of them that are 21 to 22, they're buying their first homes this year. So we, we try to take care of them well, we encourage them, we want to improve, we want them to be solid as citizens of Vermont, and we, we give them that opportunity. Um, we sell bioheating oil, we sell uh, propane, we sell wood pellets. Basically our main service area is northern Vermont for various products, although we sell wood pellets throughout the whole state of Vermont. Uh, the wood pellets we sell are basically made, most of them are made in North Clarendon, Vermont wood pellet, although in the rest of the pellets we basically handle out of northern New York, uh, out of a forest responsible, uh, I'm not getting the term right, but it's a responsible forestry program uh, mill site out there. We do our own bio blending, uh, so we built a, a plant uh, in Moors where we can blend our own biofuels to whatever percentages we want it to be. Uh, we've tried hybrid delivery trucks uh, a couple of years. Uh, didn't work real well, but we tried it. Um, we basically are very strong on no idling rules, part is for the environment, part because I'm a cheap son of a bitch and I don't want to see a truck run. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the pellets we're doing are bulk and bag. Uh, as they say, we deliver the bulk throughout the state. We did put a bulk silo uh, in North Hyde Park, so we bring pellets are trucked into there that we can distribute in the northern part of the state. Uh, the we LP, we have a lot of LP that's rail, brought in by rail into Newport for us, so again, minimizing a lot of trucking uh, and uh, uh, pollution from that so we can haul from there. We install cold climate heat pumps as re requests from our customers uh, because we are a full service company. Uh, in the last, uh, well, the other thing is we 
We're responsible to the communities we serve. We service a lot of communities. We've been very fortunate. People have looked upon us kindly. We've been competitive. Uh, we don't profess to be a cheap company. We just try to be the best company. Uh, but in that, we spoke, uh, again, as any of the other dealers will tell you, we support the communities we're in. We're the ones making the donations to the arts community, to the Cub Scout, you, you name it. If you get a door on the front main street, somebody's coming through the door looking for something. And we're the kind of companies that respond to that. Um, going back to the, the fuels, in the last 15 months, we basically, between biofuels and wood pellets, in the quick math that people put together for this, we've re replaced about 630,000 gallons of uh, number two heating oil, and there are other products that we sell. Um, how, over the past how? 15 months. 15 months? Yeah. That's amazing. So uh, the bio has, the, we use, has, we, We've always been trying to get the recycled or renewable. Uh, there was a plant in uh, called White Mountain Bio in New Hampshire. Unfortunately, they went out of business or were sold to another thing. But that was recycled cooking oils, what was our primary product to start with. Now we're picking up out of a company in Rhode Island. I believe it's recycled, but it's, it's bio is what I can tell you. I, we don't want palm oil, but whether it's re totally recycled, I couldn't tell you that. I, I don't have an honest uh, answer on that one. But we just feel it's important to continue that blend. And anybody that buys fuel from us doesn't have a choice. It's, we sell all bile. We, we do have a few customers that burn B99, though that is a specific request. But everything else is uh, we put through our plant varies in relation to because we are in a competitive market. It ref reflects to uh, how much we blend to what the market allows us to do because we are in a competitive market. Um, we can't, one price doesn't fit all. So, so does the, um, uh, when you say it's competitive in terms of the kind of blending that you can do? Uh, uh, price. Price. Oh, okay. People so, are, you know, it's price. Yep. Yeah. So uh, you blend what you can to the price that the right. market will bear. Correct. Um, you had mentioned in the beginning, um, obviously, the number of employees that you have. Um, some some younger techs you're yep. hiring from uh, from Green Mountain, Green Mountain Tech Center is where most of them come. Hyde Park is five miles away. And do they do, do they have a particular training program that you are uh, interacting with them on? That you yeah, the tech has a HVAC program, heating ventilating program, mm -hmm. and then also we continue <coughs> their training. And, and we set ourselves, our employees at that level have a particular. As they get more licensure and more skill sets, it directly reflects to their income. Sure. So the more they learn, the more licenses and more skill sets. So it, we, we set up in a way that we want them to get there quickly, competently, so we structure it that way. And these people, the, these young people, there's four of them, that I'm, the original four, are, um, again, they're 21, 22 now, and they're, they're really kicking in. I mean, they're starting to get plumbing licenses and gas licenses. Uh, HVAC uh, certifications and things of that nature. Scott, uh, um, just the bio, the bio is more expensive, and that's the reason why you, you have to. It cycles up and down right now. It's more expensive, and again, we're hauling it further. Okay. So, everything everything adds a penny. Right. Right. Okay. Thanks. So, kind of question. That was essentially my question. What the what the what the difference is in the uh, in the cost for it's, that. It's the, it, it, and it varies. It's, yeah. It really comes down to demand. Massachusetts has a very aggressive bio program, so there's no theoretically loose product out there. So uh, we bring it in to make sure. So I think right now we're only doing a B2. We've done a high as a B10, again, depending on availability and pricing. We can't put ourselves at a pricing disadvantage. The last load of bio was 10 cents more a gallon than our uh, heating oil. So it's, you got you to gotta balance that and still get your margin. So just as a follow-up, I, I, I know Peter, and uh, I will say just, you know, your company is an amazing company, and it's been, you know, a, a real asset to our entire region for, for years and decades, obviously, and, and all that you do for the community, Rotary Club, for example. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we've been touched a few times. <laughs> um, no, but, um, but I will say, so in, uh, Laura was talking earlier, asking Manny earlier about the whole, I just want you to, you actually install wood pellets 
uh, so we sell we, we sell pellet equipment. The the pellet stoves are much more affordable, but to put a, a central heating system into a normal home, it's twenty thousand dollars. Okay, that's good. But but you have a more complete heating uh, we system. We have a complete uh, a, a service company. and installation service, right? Yeah. Residentially right. driven, uh, and like that. The thing is, it's. You're in a competitive market there as well. It's not like you get free reign and you're going to make, you can make up the income that you would be making on selling fuels. It's, it's very competitive and it's, and it's tough. And I think most energy dealers uh, uh, that have the same package of goods that we have will tell you that making the service, having the service department or installation department really produce the revenue needed to support it is phenomenally difficult. It is not easy at all because we're trying to provide a service 24-7. So you're paying people, you know, we send a, when a serviceman goes out at night, he gets paid time and half of the time. He leaves his home to the time he gets back to his home. Now, he could be driving 45 minutes to the first call, be charged for one call, and he goes back home. He could theoretically be making, getting paid for, you know, three to four hours of time and a half. I get to bill a customer for one hour, maybe two, depending on what he ran into. And then he gets home and goes back. I mean, so when you start looking at that overhead, what I'm trying to get is the overhead carrying costs. It's like people say, geez, you're charging, you know, we charge $99 an hour. Well, look at the money you make. No, no, the overhead with this is very extensive. The labor costs are, are phenomenal. It's just, but you want to have good people, you got to hire, you got to pay them. And who, which one of us wants to get out of bed at three in the morning and hop yeah, into okay. a truck at 10 below? Hard to find a lot of people that want to do that and do it competently. Yeah. And that's part of the thing. So when you're looking at these other things, I, I think what I'm concerned about as I sit here and then been thinking about this, is that Borns has been done, we've done a really good job. We, you know, we, we, we cut, we've danced on the edge. Sometimes it's the bleeding edge, sometimes the cutting edge, but we've done it at our own risk. We've, we've thought this was worthy of that risk like that. But if we screw up or if we fail, I own it. It's all mine. I can't go back to my, my customers and say, geez, you know, we had this great idea, it failed, and we're gonna raise the price 10 cents can't do it. I'm not a utility. I am a independent business owner trying to run a business in a very competitive market and market. So that's what we're working on. I don't know what the hell she's going to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> Send them into rotary. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike, and then Mike. Yeah, and uh, you may have answered this question, uh, if I understand, you B2 and B10, but is, does that refer to the percentage? Sorry, yes, it does. Biodiesel? Correct. So 2%, B2 is 2%, so B10. So your, um, your maximum blend is 10% biodiesel? Well, is that, is that we saying? can go, you can go higher. There's a certain point where the equipment gets, a, the, the heating equipment itself, you want to be sensitive to that. One, the more bio, if you have older tanks, your biofuel in its own entity is a cleaning agent. So if you put in a tank that has a lot of sludge in it from being 20, 30 years old, mm -hmm. you're going to free that all up and you're going to plug the furnace up. Mm -hmm. It's going to plug the nozzle, the fuel system at some point. That's one issue. The other is not all burners are, you know, will handle it nicely. Most will. <coughs> I mean, we're going for a B20. That tells me that the, the next step in the transition. But it's really letting the equipment catch up with the tech, you know, the fuel and the technology kind of stay hand in hand going through this. Do you, do you know your customers to the extent that you can say, well, I recommend this uh, blend uh, if, they, if, they're, if they're interested in biodiesel. I recommend this blend instead of this one because uh, your tank is pretty old and... I can't do it. There's no way in the world you'd be able to do it. We just, we're going with, we're the service company and most of our customers, if we get it wrong, we know where it's going to end up, and that matter lap, and it's not going to be very nice. But there's no way in the world. When we load our truck, we're loading the whole truck at whatever B level, B2, B10, right, like that. That's that, and that's where it's just going out there. We've been doing it long enough now that more than likely the uh, the older tanks that we would be worried about have cycled through enough of it. It's probably not so much of an issue. But if a new customer came on board with an older tank, we might create some havoc for a little while. Yeah. So, um, the, other, the only other thing I want to say is I thank you for your environmental consciousness and your uh, diversification. I think that's a, a terrific model that you got there. So. Thank you. I, I think you already answered the question, one of the questions I had, and that was, so the biodiesel is about 10 cents more a gallon than for... for Maybe company. today. 
Yeah. It's, it, we're talking a market that's no, yep. it's like oil. Oil's up five cents, it could be down 10 cents next week. I mean, it, 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 and it's tied to that. It's all tied to what the mercantile and however each individual producer wants to set their price structure. And then, you know, Matt had talked about a lot of these uh, bigger industries, I believe, uh, getting off the number six fuel to the CNG fuel. Mm -hmm. What's the price difference there? I have, you know, that I have no idea. I, I, that's a, definitely, that's per se above my pay grade yeah. in relation. We don't deal that level. And, and, yeah. We don't, we don't, retailers don't sell, excuse me, Peter, uh, don't sell uh, number six fuel. That's delivered by a heated uh, tanker truck, not by the retail companies that deliver in 2,800 gallon. Trucks, so what what is that price difference roughly? Because I just want to see the you it's, know it's, where with all that these folks are. It's becoming an extinct fuel. In fact, okay. the last bastion for six oil has been chips, and there is a recent uh, a federal excuse me international agreement called the IMO agreement. I don't know what IMO stands for, but I'll find out. Uh, which says ships no longer can use this heavy polluting fuel. You have to use diesel fuel. Uh, that happens in 2020, which is a good thing. Six oil is the is the waste product from the refinery process that was being used by heavy users, by large users. It's becoming extinct, which yeah, is a good thing. For, <laughs> for ships in 2020, for ship. yeah. Thank you. For us, for the rest of us, now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, um, Some of my questions have been answered, but just going back to biodiesel. I know originally, co cost is certainly an issue. There was, um, there were initially concerns about uh, biofuel, biodiesel degrading gaskets and gelling in cold temperatures. Yes, and like the that. original going out there, resolved. we were hearing that, and we haven't seen that as a huge issue. Uh, I mean, I, I would not sit there and say our service issues in relation to biofuel have changed. It doesn't show up on the scale for us. Again, we're saying on the you know, B10 and lower level, uh, again, we have a couple of customers that use B99. I, I haven't, they, again, it's such a small amount, it would, it would not be worthy of any kind of Measuring. Thank you. So we've got two more people. Yeah, and I, okay. and I thank I'll, you for I'll the time. Yeah. And, yeah. and if yeah. I could, and if I could bring, thank you, Peter. If I could bring Judy uh, and Casey up. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Peter, sorry. Just one, one, one uh, quick question to follow up. So when you, when you have a blend like uh, B10. You also blend the price, right? I mean, it would only. It's, it's all. In the, it's all based in. It's all based in our price. Yeah, right. I mean, if everything. Whether we're doing B10, B, I mean, it's all. Net, here's our cost. Cost of goods. I mean, we work from a margin. Right. I mean, so, but the ten cents per gallon is strict. Is a one hundred percent biodiesel. I mean, in today's. Today, yeah, yeah. today okay. being April, whatever, right. yes. So whatever the price is, is that's for 100%. So if you blend it 10%, then it's only it's, one tenth of Correct. That. It, that's correct. But 10 cent increase. Correct. So it'll be a penny increase on B10. My, my cost of goods has gone up because when I come to my retail, I'm still in a competitive okay. market. So it's how much margin do I want to eat to be able to do this? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And Chairman, you've been very generous with your time. If, uh, in order to save a little time, because I know you've been generous, if I could have Casey and Judy both come up. Great. Thank you. I just want to, just real quick, if I may, just show you a quick picture. This is my husband who passed away in 2010. He had taken the company over from his parents that started it in 66. This is his son with, I might brag, my first grandchild daughter, fourth generation coming into a family business of 12 employees that have lived and worked hard and, um, you know, I believe run a, a good community business. Uh, like I said, there's only 12 of us, uh, 12 families that I take care of. And I will tell you and put a hand on a Bible I have all the confidence in the world in the propane I sell as a clean energy. It is um, listed by the federal government as one of the cleanest fuels out there. So I'm going to defer more expertise to, to Casey. So. Thank you, Judith. Don't forget to have, introduce yourselves. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Judy Taranovich from 
Proctor Gas and Proctor Vermont. Hi, I'm Casey Coda uh, from Coda and Coda Fields uh, out of Bells Falls, Vermont, uh, third generation uh, heating fuel company. Uh, and, and, sorry, Casey, interrupt. Just wait an explanation. We're cousins. Okay. <laughs> uh, his father and my father are brothers. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. But he wouldn't let me work on the equipment. <laughs> <laughs> so I became the lobbyist and he became the company. No, it's better. You saw that Matt had better skills <laughs> somewhere else. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, our family is rich with tradition in Vermont. Um, one of the uh, unique stories, uh, actually, uh, Matt's, Matt and I's uh, aunt just passed away. She was the eldest Coda, uh, but she was our historian. So any Facebook posts, she was always there to let us know what the date was and what happened. Uh, we recently put up a picture uh, from uh, our first gas station uh, that we had in Pell's Falls. It was the very first 24-hour gas station in the state of Vermont. Uh, Bell's Falls was a hub for everybody who was shipping going to Boston, uh, coming through there. So the milk tankers that were coming through, that were bringing milk to Boston to make cheese, to distribute out through New England. Uh, and our family was tied with that. We got into the heating oil business uh, in 1941. Uh, I, my grandmother and grandfather, the reason it's Coda and Coda, uh, she wanted to make sure her name was on it as well. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, we knew who really ran the company. Um, in 1973, my uh, father bought the business uh, from my grandparents. In 1995, my brother and I bought the business. Uh, so third generation, uh, my three children uh, periodically work for the business. Uh, we currently employ 100 employees. Um, we, over the years, we obviously started with one business. We now have uh, I have one division. Uh, we now have seven offices uh, throughout Southern Vermont. And we did that based upon uh, keeping core Vermont values. Doing what you say you're going to do. Stand behind the work that you do and provide the best product possible. Obviously, we sell uh, bioheating oil, uh, propane, uh, kerosene, diesel, on-road, off-road. Uh, we do sell some wood pellets. Uh, we've always tried to diversify. Uh, we have fleet maintenance, which we do. We do lots of other things throughout uh, our company. We do plumbing, heating. We put in... Uh, Oh, uh, heat pumps out of the ground uh, that we've done. We've done lots of different things, trying different cutting edge things. Obviously, we're, we're a for-profit company, so uh, certain things that we've tried that have failed, um, you know, we've, we've had to go back to other things that we know are successful. Um, but the thing that's unique about Code and Coda and where we've talked about training that is done throughout the state. Uh, we built our own classroom. We train all of our tax drivers ourselves. Uh, we have our own hands-on classroom. It's part of one of the warehouses that I built. Uh, it was an old cheese plant that went out of business in 1962. It was dormant for a long time. We moved into that building and, and felt it was a great space to be able to utilize uh, to do that. Uh, through attrition over the years, we've probably trained all of our competition uh, in our area uh, because there's a level of uh, expectation of what we expect out of our techs. Uh, there is a code of difference that we, we believe in. Um, we feel that if we train them ourselves through the school, through cer certified instructors who are employees of Code and Coda, uh, that we get the best employees out there We've always taken the view of uh, making sure our customers use less every year. Um, since the 1980s, we were selling System 2000 heating systems, which uh, can save customers up to 40% off of their heating fuel uh, just through conservation. Uh, my brother's house, he bought an old Victorian home in Bells Falls, uh, used about 4,000 gallons a year. Um, which was crazy for me to fathom that a house could use that much. 
But we changed that. We put a system 2000 in. Didn't insulate the house, didn't change anything. I used about 1,700 gallons a year after that before he did any of the renovations. So we've been doing that since the early 1980s and even before. Um, and you figure as we've done that, we've reduced our consumption uh, for our customers. And that's always been a family priority. We're Vermonters. It is about conservation, doing doing more with less, right, yeah, Judy? Right. Um, and and that's always been our our effort to go that way. Um, the other difference is, as an industry, we're all friends, though. Yeah. Manny, Peter, Judy, and I, uh, we know each other. Uh, it, it's it's handshakes and hugs. We know each other. Uh, we really care about one another. Uh, the things that make uh, Judy and I very similar is that we're the we're the glue that holds our communities together. You know, I know yeah. Judy pays her employees well. We do. Peter's talked about it. Uh, but we're the ones who, when the Little League needs to build a new field, um, we do that. I, I know you guys helped rebuild the field in your town. Yeah. We did it in Bells Falls. I was the point person on the Little League board. Um, we did that in Ludlow. We rebuilt the Little League field. Um, we sponsor youth sports. We helped uh, uh, the theater in Saxon River, Vermont, when they burnt down. We helped donate so that they could rebuild the theater. Um, where my uh, nephew, who has uh, Asperger's, he excels by uh, acting and doing those things, and, and it was great to be able to help with that. Yeah. When people need help, Code and Coda, I know, is there. I know Proctor Gas is there. Um, we encourage all of our managers uh, to be part of the community. Um, we wouldn't have had, we would have been able to grow to seven offices if the if the bill that we're thinking about passing now we would have been able to do that because we we needed storage in those areas. Uh, that was important for us. But what we brought in every town that we got to, we're, we're part of the community. Um, there was a discussion about acquisitions earlier, and, and it's true. And one of the conversations that I have with my company is what I sell is no different than what Irving sells. The only thing that sets me apart is the customer service and the fact that I see my customers when I go to the grocery store or when I'm at church. They know they can contact me. They know they can get a hold of me. Um, if, if there's a problem, they pick up the phone and where they come walking through the office. Uh, I'm there. I'm not in Canada or Whippany, New Jersey or Pennsylvania. I'm in their community. And, and we're very much a hands-on um, company. And to the point of the additional um, two cent fuel tax, we, we do our part to help with the weatherization. We have a program in place through BFDA where um, we give back to families that can't afford to heat their homes. My company sits down at Christmas time and we, we together as a group, because my CSRs are more in touch with the customers than I am on a daily basis, okay, who's struggling? You know, who just lost a husband and, and mom is sick and they've got four kids and there's just no way they can pay that heating bill. It goes away. That's a lot more than two cents or $15 a year. I wipe out $500 bills. Uh, we are the pulse of our community and we know the families in our homes that have the true need more so than you can't possibly know who has a need sitting here in Proctor, Vermont. I do. And we take care of them. And, and Casey takes care of his community. And Pete takes care of his community. We do our part. Well, um, so I, I'm interested, um, Judy, in your company um, serves Proctor. How how kind of why, how far do you go? How far do your trucks go? Kind of beyond um, the immediate. So I see I service primarily Rutland County. I don't go over to to New York, so I don't cross that border. 
but I head down towards Manchester, okay. um, over to Ludlow, and then not quite up to to Middlebury, about a 40 mile range. Yeah, and, and, and I was curious about that relative, Casey, to your, you've got a number of offices. Right. Uh, and I don't know if they're offices or storage facilities, or if they're. Um, some are just offices, and we sort of obviously you strategically try and place. Uh, do, you, do you think of that as, as from a storage facility or an office, you can kind of serve a 40 mile? I don't know what the magic number is. Um, <laughs> it depends on the terrain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Obviously, yeah. Vermont is very mountainous, yeah. so yeah. Uh, there's some mountains you don't want to have to climb every single day if you have to go refill. Um, so it, it depends on the region we currently have, probably. Uh, I believe six uh, facilities okay. now and so some share one and that's usually what we try and do uh, depending on the size that we do and, and how many customers you have in that area so so we we do try and share it and make sure uh, they're there but that's also the cost of uh, uh, businesses you know obviously whether you have to pay extra overtime um, again if it was less infrastructure our drivers would have to drive more than an hour one way for some of our locations uh, to turn around, load, that's going to take a half an hour, turn around and go back. Um, so and what, what does that do? Well, that increases your cost. Uh, maybe that means we don't employ as many people. Um, and, and that sort of, that's the struggles that we face on a daily basis because if I build a new bulk plant facility, that's easily a half a million dollar uh, investment that that is just our overhead we have to be able to figure out how can we do that and still be competitive with our competition uh, to do that and so uh, that's always been our focus of you know doing it the right way uh, you know we're we don't want to really go out any further than where we can provide good timely service right. either if it's two hours to the customer and you, you drive two hours, you get out there and you don't have the part you need, right. could be an hour back to a, you know, an FW Web or wherever you need to get the part. And the, so and the, the service piece is important. And the thing that makes us different from a utility, and, and I, it, it, there really is a huge dis, distinction between what we do. I'm sure everybody in this room has lost power in here at some point in their, their life, right? When it comes back on, is it within two hours? Maybe once in a while. Sometimes it's days, sometimes it's weeks. I know when we had the bomb cyclone and we had those storms, there were people without power for several weeks, at least I know in our area. Um, the fact that when people lose heat with Coda, uh, we're, we're, we're there within a couple hours you're going to have heat back on that day. I could only imagine the cry to the Attorney General's office if we left thousands of customers without heat. Hell, if we're, if we're slow getting to a customer, I'm probably getting a call from the Attorney General saying... And, and an app uh, saying we're going to be there right. the app isn't going to work. Right. <laughs> um, and so that's the connection we have. We go into people's homes. It is very personal. Um, there is a special connection that's different than any other industry, I believe. Where you go into a store, there's not that personal connection. Uh, your home is your livelihood. It's the most valuable asset you will ever own uh, for most homeowners, most Vermonters. And uh, so th there's a tight connection. So our ability to have the infrastructure to be able to get to do those things within a couple hours, uh, that is integral to, to our business. And, and for our customers, um, you know, we pride ourselves on those times. I think, I can't remember, I think you were asking Manny about, um, is our industry doing anything to help with efficiencies? There actually are programs through our National Association and um, <coughs> PERP, which is the Propane Education and Research Council, where um, depending on how many new appliances you put either in a new build or reconstructions, there's rebates that come back. Um, and actually, they're changing the numbers of appliances. But I think, for instance, in a new build, if you're putting in five appliances, you can get back $1,500. If you're putting in three appliances, I believe it's around 750 
Um, so, so there are incentives to uh, put in appliances that burn more efficient, efficiently and cleaner. Yeah, um, Casey, you um, mentioned ground heat pumps. Uh, 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 you mean geothermal? Geothermal, pumps? sorry. Yeah, how many systems have you installed there? Uh, we've done about five. Five? <laughs> five, so probably over the course of 15 years. They, yeah, they're, they're very expensive. I, yeah, so we we did one on Okemo Mountain, which I thought was crazy because uh -huh. they'd have to drill really deep to get down to some warm water. Um, and <coughs> they ended up drilling uh, five wells at, at a cost of uh, $6,000 a piece for each well, not to mention that's before you even do any of the piping inside. So. Obviously, those opportunities are, are incredibly expensive. So, uh, the, the pool of clientele to be able to do that to put in a uh, eighty thousand uh, dollar heating system, uh, and, and they have propane as a backup. Uh, the heat pumps uh, worked up until they got November, and then they used propane uh, throughout. Now. Uh, it's a large home, you know, it's not an average home. Uh, and so, you know, it's probably 5,000 square foot home. Uh, but even oh, though they had one spent... One house? I thought you were talking about a whole... Oh, house. God. Wait, this is one you, house. Yeah, this one is house. So, so it's a massive home. Right. High rent area. So, so that was a unique one. We've done some other ones that are smaller scales. Uh, we did one for a gentleman. Uh, in Saxons River, but three quarters of the house is buried in dirt, so he has the insulation factor because you can only see a corner of the top floor uh, on the house. It's near where uh, uh, Matt's family uh, lives. Um, is he a short guy like a hobbit? <laughs> <laughs> he loves the dark. Um, but so those situations where it works. So we, we've tried to do a lot of innovative things uh, with that. Um, and, and diversification has always been part of uh, everybody's uh, product. I'm sure, Peter, when the company first started, you were just selling product. You weren't fixing things as most companies did. And, and so if people got into the repair business, got into those service. Um, you know, and again, uh, we're proud to be Vermonters. We're proud of what we do. Uh, I had a, a quick little story just to explain who we are as uh, individuals got a letter from uh, one of my CSRs she got a call and she's new uh, new to our company but doesn't you know doesn't get the full effect of who we are because it takes a little bit uh, she said I just want to share a story that I received today from a customer Kathleen I'll leave her last name out moved back to the area after being down south for some time she was happy to see that her new home works with Code and Coda. She went on to tell me a few years ago that when she still lived in town, she was headed to work on a cold morning at 6.30 a.m. She realized she was driving with a flat, a tire that was flat. She pulled into one of our parking lots and some very, someone very nice came out to help her. They helped her change her tire. They brought the other one down to put air in it. Uh, come to find out the spare was also flat. <coughs> Um, and obviously she wasn't going to be able to go anywhere. Uh, she noted, but the thing that she remarked on, the person stayed with her until the tow truck showed. She wanted me to know that she was always thankful and grateful for that help, and that it was months later when she saw an article in the paper and realized that the man who helped her was Casey. She wanted us to know that she had never forgotten the generosity and I was one of the owners of the company, and this is one of the many reasons that she is happy to have Code and Code as their heating provider. That story is not uh, rare; it's commonplace, and uh, and as Vermonters, we should all be proud that you have thoughtful, caring organizations uh, that heat your homes, that do the things that uh, I know, Jade. Judy and I take pride in every day, and, and it's not something we take lightly. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate your time. For, for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you.